In this lesson, we look at the Blinky module. Now, all this module does is blinks an LED. I included it because this function is sometimes used as a first bare metal exercise for embedded. Of course, those exercises are usually just a couple lines of code, and this module requires quite a few more. I figured I had to make a Blinky that could actually be useful for something. So the intent of this module is it allows you to display like an error code or a run mode to the user. I have used products that had LEDs used in this way. So this module repeats the cycle. It blinks N1 times with a period of T1 milliseconds where N1 and T1 are parameters. It then waits two second, seconds. It then blinks N2 times with a period of T2 milliseconds and then waits two seconds and then repeats. So in this case, N1 is the code you're trying to convey to the user, some integer. And T1 is 1,000 milliseconds by default. So this is a slow blink that a user could count. N2 and T2 are a code separator. And the default is that N2 is 5 and T2 is uh, 200 uh, milliseconds. So it's a clearly a very fast blink. And the code separator is intended to help the user know when the code is about to start and confirm when it has finished. Now you might have a better idea on how to do this. I just came up with this uh, without a lot of thought. Um, now the, the module contains some console commands and we'll look at these uh, later on the um, when we're looking on the console. Now let's look at the Blinky API in the header file. In the configuration structure, we see the dout index, which indicates which LED we are to blink. And then we see these parameters that we just discussed, uh, the number of blinks in the period of a blink, uh, both for the code and for the separator. In terms of the core APIs, uh, we see these. There is no run API, uh, blinky underscore run, because everything is actually done via timers. And then we have these other um, module level APIs that are used to set those parameters. Here we see the major interactions between the blinky module and others, and there are three. Uh, the Blinky module has console commands, so it interacts with the command module. Of course, it uses the DIO module to turn the LED on and off. And finally, it uses a timer to control the blink periods, so it interacts with the timer module. The operation of Blinky is based on a state machine. If you are not familiar with state machines, it's a good topic to learn if you're going to work in embedded. I won't go through background on state machines, but we'll describe the one used for Blinky. So here is the chart showing the Blinky state machine. There are many different styles for these charts, and often the style is tailored by the author based on the information they want to highlight. Also, there's only so much information you can get on a chart, and I might be pushing the limit here. First, note these abbreviations. TE is timer expired event, and BC is a blink counter. In this diagram, the blue rectangles represent states. And within the state, above the line is the name, name of the state, blink on in this case, and below the line are actions that are taken when you enter this state. So when you enter the blink on state, you set the LED on, and you set the timer to T1 over 2. The text on these uh, transition arrows show um, events and possibly conditions to make you transi transition from one state to the next. So here's a simple case. If you're in the blink off state and the timer expires, you go into the blink on state. Here's a more complicated version. If you're on the blink on state, the timer expires, 
and the incremented blink counter is less than N1, you go to blink off. However, over here, if the timer expires and the incremented blink counter is greater than or equal to N1, you go to the post blink delay. And there's one more thing to look at. If, if these transition labels have a bar, like this one, the thing that shows up below the bar is an action when that transition is made. So in this case, if you're in the pre-blink pre -blink delay, and the uh, timer expires, and N1 is greater than zero, then you take the action of setting the blink counter to zero, and then enter the state. So I think that's all on notation. So let's go through the operation. Often on a state machine, there is an entry point indicated. And on this state machine, that is here. So when the system first starts, or after any parameter is changed, we go into the state. And this is the pre-link delay. We set the LED off. We set the timer to two um, seconds or 2,000 milliseconds. And then there are two ways we can exit this state. One is that the timer expires and N1 is greater than zero. In that case, we set the blink counter to zero as an action, and then we enter the blink on state. And when we enter the blink on state, we turn the LED on and we set the timer to T1 over 2. And then I won't go through this in detail, but basically we go back and forth between these two states until we've blinked enough times and n one times. And then when that happens, we then enter the post blink delay state, turn the LED off, set the timer to 2000 milliseconds. And then there's, we do another procedure similar to what we did before. Um, if when the timer expires, if N2 is greater than zero, we go into the separator on state, turn the LED on, and then we toggle between these two states with the LED on and off until we have blinked enough times, uh, N2 times in fact. When we have done that, we go and uh, we're back into the pre-blink delay. So that's sort of the cycle. Now, I, I missed two transitions, or I sort of skipped them. One is if we are in the pre-blink delay and the timer expires, but N1, the N1 count is equal to zero, we skip this blinking and go right to the post-blink delay. And similar to that, if we're in the post-blink delay and the timer expires and N2 is set to zero, we go straight to the pre-blink delay. So the idea is by setting those N1 or N2 to zero, you can skip some of the uh, blinking states. One last thing to show you, if ever there is some kind of internal error, what it does is sets the state to off, turns the LED off, turns the timer off, and or stops the timer. And now um, this, this module is stuck in that state. It can start running again if the user uh, changes a parameter. That will give it a kick and it will start running again. Now let's look at the Blinky implementation. So again, the first thing I like to do is look at the state. First of all, here is an enumeration of the states. Uh, these are the states we just saw on that state uh, machine diagram. And then here is the overall state of the module. And one of these uh, is the actual state itself. Um, here is the blink counter that we saw in that state machine. And uh, it also contains the configuration, which would have the blink counts in the periods, uh, which were 
referred to as N1, N2, D1, or T1, and T2. Here, as we've seen in lots of modules, is the information for the console commands. Here are the uh, APIs, and here is the, the core APIs, and here is getting the default configuration, and you can see the values in there. Um, here is the init function, um, and the start function. Start function looks like it has a lot of code. It's a lot of error logging and so forth. The start function, for instance, is validating the that the um, digital out digital I/O index is valid. These are the APIs that change the various parameters the code blinks, the separator blinks, and the periods and so forth. I should mention uh, they all have a s do a similar thing. They update the configuration in the state and they call this start function, which we'll see in a little while. Here are the um, console commands, blinky status, and um, this is a case where we use a single command, a single function, or two different commands because they're very similar. And the way you do this is you do the common processing, but you'll notice right here it checks the command to see if it's equal to blinks versus sep. And uh, so some of this code is shared and, uh, and then some of it is, uh, it, it does a check and does one thing or the other based on exactly which command was executed. Here is that start function. And the start function, the key is it's setting, it's setting the state equal to this state. Um, if you remember from the state machine diagram, this is sort of the entry point. And it sets the timer and sets the LED. Now here is the blinker timer callback. And the state machine is pretty much driven by timer expired. Well, in fact, it's completely driven by a timer expired uh, event. So when the timer callback is called, it means that the timer expired. So there are so many ways to implement state machines. Um, and depending on the complexity of the state machine, people will use tables and all sorts of things. And, um, and it can make it easier to maintain and less code, uh, particularly on a large state machine. Uh, there are frameworks, there are so many ways of doing it. Um, for st small state machines, um, unless I'm working on a product that has state machines all over the place, if the state machine is small, just a handful of states, I will often use this style. Now, as I mentioned, in this particular state machine, there's really only one kind of event, and that is timer expired. If you have different kinds of events, um, the, the state machine gets more complicated because uh, normally for each type of event and each state, there's a certain, um, there's certain logic that's executed. But anyhow, in this case, we just switch on the current state, and then uh, in some cases, for example here, if we're in the state separator off, we get the timer expired, we go directly to separator on, we set the LED on, and we uh, determine what the next timer value is going to be. And it's very simple. Here are some cases up here is where there's a condition. So uh, this is the case where you're in the uh, state separator on, and the timer expires, and the action that you take depends on whether or not the blink counter has reached a certain value. And you can see that right here. This is very much like what's on the state machine. It increments the blink counter and compares it to a, uh, a configuration parameter. So again, if you haven't used uh, state machines, I think this would be a introduction of a fairly simple one. And um, so it would be useful to read this code. That's it for the implementation. So let's try out the console commands. As you can see, I have a camera image of the board. And the little board to the right is the GPS module. Now, here is the blinky LED. 
right there. And there's also a blinking LED on the uh, GPS module right here, but that's the one second, one pulse per second uh, signal, nothing to do with blinky. So if we watch this, we will see there are the fast blinks, and then we will see five slow blinks, a pause, and then five fast blinks. So that's the the uh, default pattern. We can look at the commands that are available and the one is blinky status and that includes these are the current parameters of the blinking and then this has the the internal state and the blink count um, and if we issue this command repeatedly we can see it going through the states um, I'll do it again. You see things like here's the state is four, and then it becomes six, uh, and then it becomes one, and so forth. So we could follow that on the state um, machine diagram. So now we could go to two blinks, but set them to 2,000 milliseconds per blink, so somewhat slower. So there is the first and the second blink, and then there are the fast blinks again. Um, we can change the fast blinks, the separator blinks, going from 5 to, say, 10, and we'll leave the uh, period alone. So there are the two slow blinks, and then we should now get 10 fast blinks looks about right. I'm not sure how well you can see this on the video. And now let's turn off the blinks entirely. So now we see the fast blinks. We see nothing. And we see the fast blinks again. So that gives you an idea of the blinky module. And uh, that's, that's all for this module, and thanks again for watching.